the nice thing about YouTube streams is I can just edit this out later on. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I think whatever, leaving and um, coming back seems to fix the problem. Okay. Um, so thanks. Thanks so much for your patience with that. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about deep learning methods that can be used uh, for curating data at scale. Um, and you know, th this uh, lecture is essentially going to be a pretty broad overview of the potential of deep learning to unlock new data sources. Um, and so um, I think most people have an appreciation for the fact that data curation is just really central to everything, you know, or many things that we do in quantitative social science, uh, because it fundamentally shapes questions that we think to pose, as well as questions that are feasible to answer. Um, we are a relatively young field. There's still tons of questions out there that are really important uh, to people's lives that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on. And the more kind of tools that we have at our disposal to create meaningful quanti quantitative data, you know, the more uh, questions that that opens, us, opens up for us to actually be able to examine. Um, and so advances in deep learning applied to challenging problems, whether it be in computer vision or natural language processing, have already revolutionized um, many fields, you know, from information retrieval to medicine to astronomy. Um, and they have the potential, I think, to really um, revolutionize what we're able to do in social science as well. But understanding and applying the methods uh, requires some significant startup costs. Um, and today I wanna to focus on um, the sorts of data that deep learning methods can create, um, as well as educational and software resources that my group has been uh, working on to make uh, these methods more accessible to economists. And so really the emphasis is on using deep learning um, to process information that in its raw form is not computable, to take that information and convert it into structured data um, that we can actually use uh, to do various analyses. Um, and so, you know, just to give a little bit of um, motivating background, if you go back uh, 30 years ago, uh, the massive growth in the power of personal computing completely revolutionized um, the quantitative social sciences and general economics, specifically um, unleashing the first empirical revolution. Um, personal computing completely changed the types of data that could be collected um, and the types of data that we could process. You know, if you're running a regression on a mainframe computer, you're pretty limited in what you can do. Uh, personal computing just completely changed that, but it also just changed the data that, that we could collect in the first place. We could take a, compu a computer to the field and collect data much more easily than you would have been able to do um, uh, before a personal computing came on the scene. And I think there's a lot of parallels to, you know, between that moment and where we're at today. Um, so as with the empirical revolution that happened in the 1990s, um, there's been recent monumental advances in computing that have revolutionized um, many other disciplines um, and have the potential to significantly expand the questions that we as economists are now uh, tackling. Um, and in particular, advances in GPU compute and the availability of cheap cloud compute makes it possible to process data on a previously unimaginable scale. You know, so for the past couple of months, I've been running a thousand virtual CPUs on Microsoft Azure around the clock. You know, I obviously wouldn't have had, you know, a, a thousand CPUs in my home office, right? And just the fact that that sort of, um, you know, uh, compute is available in the cloud, uh, at scale makes a big difference to the questions we can ask, as well as, you know, things like GPU compute that have just uh, totally opened up a lot of um, methods that just wouldn't have been practical um, to implement in the past. And so I think, you know, we're at a point again where there's been just this sort of massive leap um, in the computing that is available, easily available at our fingertips, and that's really changing uh, the sorts of questions that we're able to ask as economists. Um, and in particular, I think it really has uh, the potential to change the sorts of raw information that we can take and turn it into data. Um, and so, for example, 
uh, raw information might take the form of image scans of historical documents. So scans of tables, firm level reports, government administrative records, newspapers, directories. Um, the scans may be of poor quality. The layouts of the document can be highly complex. Um, but of course, raw information could also be contained in uh, text. And we might want to know what topics are discussed. How are they discussed? What's their sentiment? Um, raw data could be contained in photographs or videos, audio files, satellite imagery you know, essentially in a lot of different formats. And the really cool thing about deep learning is that the methods for processing all of these data are, you know, essentially very analogous. Um, and so if you have a good understanding of the methods that underlie, you know, image processing and extracting, you know, uh, tabular data out of image, uh, document image scans, you're gonna have a really good start to thinking about um, NLP and how to process text as well. Um, and, so these deep learning methods have the potential to both unlock traditional data that economists have always used, but on a larger scale um, in contexts where manual digitization is unfeasible. You know, so say that um, there's manuscript census records, they've never been digitized, it would cost $29 million, um, even if you had the labor force to digitize them all by hand. Um, but with um, deep learning and automat automation, we can scale that up and access that data that before wouldn't have been accessible. Um, but it can also just completely change the types of information that are computable data. Um, so to take an example, you know, there's a saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, if you look at the qualitative historical literature, they talk a lot about iconic images, famous images that appeared in the newspaper and really changed public perceptions and public discussion. Um, but, you know, most quantitative social scientists would examine text, um, you know, because traditionally those methods have been more accessible. But with deep learning uh, based methods, we can actually track the dissemination of photographs across tens of millions of pages of historical media across time. And that opens up kind of this new and important source of data that before we just wouldn't have had really a way to access. Um, another, you know, I think really powerful application of this is just that a lot of kind of uh, fundamental questions that have received a lot of attention in recent years, like questions about inequality or about misallocation, um, really require disaggregated data to think about. You need data on individuals or firms or communities. You just can't answer these questions um, with aggregate data. Um, but usually um, the disaggregated data that we have is either very recent, you know, or for um, a high income sort of well institutionalized context. Um, typically, these sort of disaggregated data haven't been digitized historically, even in developing countries today, they might keep administrative records in a hard copy format. And manually converting the information into computable data when we're talking about micro level data can just be prohibitively um, costly. Um, and you know the same thing about text, and I'm sure you've had other lectures here talk about text, and there's just a huge amount of information in text. Um, that, you know, text itself is not a computable object, but we have really powerful methods now to think about how we would um, make meaningful computable measures out of that. In many ways, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, a parallel question. Um, and so fortunately, you know, the computing to do this already exists. The deep learning methods um, largely already exist. Um, but they need to be fine tuned to our applications, you know, including, you know, potentially with some methodological innovations, certainly some tailored interfaces that allow us to interact um, with um, the computer in a way that is conducive to our goals as social scientists and processing the data. Um, and without this, the approaches are not going to tend to um, work well off the shelf. And so it's not that we can just take methods that computer scientists have developed and just, you know, um, apply them without thinking about how are we going to tailor these to our particular questions. Um, and so that's, that's what essentially I want to talk about today. Um, and so I want to give a couple of motivating examples of types of information that we have been processing um, using deep learning methods. Um, just, you know, I think that, 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 that people um, on this uh, call have a better sense than most people in the profession about kind of the sorts of information that can be processed with deep learning, but I wanna give you kind of a, a, a concrete sense for the sorts of economic questions that these information processing methods can open up 
Um, and then I also want to say something briefly about why deep learning. I mean, there's other methods like why aren't why aren't we using those? Um, and then I want to talk about novel resources for implementing deep learning pipelines at scale, including our open source uh, document image analysis package, which is called layout parser. And I want to introduce you guys to that and the event that that package is something that could be uh, useful for your research. Okay, so to start with some motivating examples. Um, and so one of our ongoing projects um, using a wide array of deep learning methods um, has been to extract structured data from historical newspapers at scale. And so once you have structured data, by which I mean individual headlines, their associated articles, the captions that are associated with specific images, um, you can use those to measure sentiment, to query content in a way that accounts for complex vocabulary, to study how ideas diffuse and evolve across space and time, to measure polarization um, in the discussion of various um, you know, major policy issues, et cetera. And so there's essentially just a ton that you can do with that uh, structured data. And uh, we've been using uh, deep learning to extract that structured data from over 35 million page scans um, that span over 10,000 US uh, community newspapers across uh, more than a century. And so if you were just to take these image scans and put them in an OCR engine, um, it's going to completely kind of um, fail to give you any type of structured data. Um, you know, first of all, we found that almost universally, it's going to read the newspaper like it's a single column book, because that's what the commercial OCR engines were trained on. Uh, but newspapers almost always have multiple columns, and so all the text is going to be scrambled up. It also has no way to tell what's a header, what's a headline, what's a caption, what's an article. And so essentially, if you just put this into OCR engine, everything's going to be all scrambled up. It's going to get confused by the document and totally fail the OCR certain regions of the page. The OCR may be bad quality. Um, you know, even a relatively simple layout like this one, it's going to screw up. Um, you know, it, it will tend to screw up. And um, so um, the literature that uses historical newspapers um, primarily like focuses on keywords. So it just says, does this word or how often does this word appear in this newspaper? And it doesn't matter if you're looking at keywords, if everything's all scrambled up, you know, that's going to be accurate up to OCR errors, up to the fact that there's complex vocabularies, right? That there may be many ways to say the same thing that can be hard to pre-specify. Um, but because essentially with existing data, you just have this, you know, scrambled up kind of words that appear on a page. You can't measure sentiment with that. Um, you can't really measure topics that would use complex language, which is very common. You can't trace the dissemination of content, which may be abridged or reproduced very accurately um, through national news markets. Um, and these are all things that you can do with uh, advances in natural language processing once you have the structured text. And so essentially what we have is a pipeline where every stage of it is based on deep learning methods. Uh, the first stage, we recognize the layouts in the newspapers, by which I mean we recognize the coordinates and classes, whether it be article, headline, caption, um, header, et cetera, of each individual region um, in the newspaper. Once we have those individual regions, um, we OCR those. And the, you know, now the structure is very simple. Each of those individual regions kind of looks like a single column book, so it will OCR well. Um, then we need to put the content back together, predict the reading orders, which again can be done with deep learning. And finally, we use modern NLP methods, um, you know, transformer-based NLP models um, to think about um, querying content. What are these newspapers talking about? You know, using essentially a dense method for passage retrieval. Um, we can think about the topics that appear, their sentiments, et cetera. So really do a lot of cool analysis with modern NLP methods once we have um, that structured data. Um, so this is an example of the first stage where we've recognized the layouts of the newspaper, the different colors or different classes. Um, 
you know, we've been running the layout and OCR analysis, as I mentioned, across a thousand virtual CPUs on Microsoft Azure, you know, um, and um, that allows us to process, you know, tens and tens of millions of pages, which sums up to hundreds of millions of articles in kind of a feasible uh, time frame. Um, okay. Uh, so I want to give another example, you know, newspapers are kind of maybe a less traditional data source in economics that we're now able to access both their text and the, um, their images, um, you know, uh, and we do image retrieval stuff too, I won't, you know, talk about that in detail, but essentially you just have a huge amount of information there. Um, but we can also kind of access more traditional data sources that look a lot like what economists typically work with, but that would just be too costly. Um, to process by hand. Um, and so particularly, I've been interested in this in the context of East Asia um, and understanding better what explains East Asia's spectacular growth performance in the 20th century. Um, if you try to do this with aggregate data, you know, I've just found that it's not very satisfactory. You really need information, I think, on firms and individuals um, to really figure out, you know, better what, what is going on and to test different hypotheses about the determinants of, of economic growth. Okay. Um, and so, you know, fortunately for us, incredibly rich firm and individual level data do exist back to the early 20th century. That's particularly true for uh, Japan, which has just phenomenal, uh, very rich um, historical data, but it would be completely unfeasible to digitize these information by hand. There's firm level records yearly for tens of thousands of firms that have information about their personnel and their balance sheets. Um, a lot of information is there, but you can never find uh, like enough people um, who can read the historical Japanese, which is different from modern Japanese, um, who would be willing to, to type that in for hand by you, even if you had an infinite budget, like which we don't. Um, and so if you wanna access these records in any systematic way, um, you really need automated digitization, but you know, it's, it's not been a trivial process. And so this is an example of what a raw, um, document scan may look like. These are tables and they have information about firms and their balance sheets. Um, it's going from um, right to left with sort of top to bottom with a different orientation about uh, than, than English would have. But essentially we have the, a lot of rich uh, information here in this single scan. Then we have hundreds of thousands of scans that look like this scan. Um, and so our pipeline here First of all, you can see in the top image, you know, there's some things like text bleed that result from kind of poor scanning quality. And we can use um, generative deep learning models, like in particular CycleGAN, um, to convert images like the top one into images like the bottom one um, that look much cleaner. This is all done with unpaired data, and so it's quite feasible. And so first we pre-process these images to kind of clean up the noise in them um, using deep learning. Um, and then we use a deep learning based approach. It's similar to what we do for the newspapers based on a model called Mask our CNN uh, to recognize the document layouts. And so we recognize that there's different types of information, um, you know, in these tables and ex automatically extract their structures. Um, and so again, the different colors here are like the different regions of these tables. And we need to classify, you know, for each firm what piece of information is, is gives us what, uh, so we can put that into a structured database. So we do that by recognizing document layouts. Um, if you try to send this to um, Google Cloud Vision or Tesseract or Textract OCR, it just doesn't give us the level of accuracy we need. One thing that we're doing with these documents is tracking individuals across different years, across different sources. We need their names to OCR correctly. Um, commercial OCR engines just can't recognize the old kanji. And so we've been working um, on what I find a really cool project um, where we're training our own OCR engine. Um, you know, it's a supervised problem. We need labeled data. Again, we don't have the human resources to sit there and label hundreds of thousands of um, Japanese characters. Um, and so we actually use, again, a generative model. Um, to essentially generate our documents. So first of all, um, we use a GAN to generate a font 
that looks like the historical font used in these documents, which is different than any of the modern fonts. And then we use again as well to generate kind of fake documents that look like our real documents. Um, and those can be used to train the OCR engine. And it's really cool because once you have the ability to generate data that mimics your actual data, then essentially you have like infinite labeled data for free um, that you can use um, to train the actual OCR engine itself. And so, you know, the, the OCR component of it is also, you know, I know like OCR has this reputation in computer science for being kind of stodgy and boring and old school. Um, but in this case, we're actually, we're able to use a lot of really exciting kind of cutting edge um, uh, GAN models um, to be able to, to generate our data and then use that uh, to train the model. Um, you know, and we have other sources as well. This is an example of Japanese biographical data. Again, we kind of use a similar process. And so these are sources, again, that economists would have used before, but they just never could have used these particular sources because it's just too costly to digitize by hand. And as a result, there's this big gap in our knowledge about a traditional question, economic growth, that economists, you know, it's important for us to understand. But we just can't do it um, without finding a way to feasibly digitize the disaggregated data that we need to answer um, a lot of important questions. Okay, so that um, gives you guys a sense for, um, you know, some of the things that, 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 um, that I've been using uh, deep learning methods um, in order to, to think about, in order to get the data that I need um, to answer uh, questions that, that, that are interesting um, to me and to my collaborators. Um, and so before I give you um, an overview of some of the resources that we've created to try to make these methods more accessible to others. You know, I'll say it was a lot of investment for me to learn about this stuff. And like a lot of the resources out there, you know, they're not targeted to economists. And so it just, it wasn't a very efficient process and I wanna make it kind of more efficient for other people. Um, but before I kind of launch into our resources, I also wanna say a word about like, you know, which is the most common question I get, like, why are you doing this anyway? Like, you're not like, um, you're not a computer scientist. Isn't there some other lower cost, you know, lower fixed cost way to go about this? Um, so, so why is deep learning worth investing in in the first place? Um, so generally speaking, if you want to automate data curation, um, there's two different approaches you can take. You could write a set of instructions that tells the computer how to process the data, and you do that by defining a set of rules. So in the case of a table, you tell the computer to look for a connected you know, white space between rows of a table, for example. Or in the case of uh, text, you could tell the computer to look for certain keywords that you specify. So you write a rule, you know if, it has, if the text has this keyword, um, you know, then give me a value of one. <laughs> Um, and so that's kind of how a lot of us are used to interacting with computers. We write, we write rules and then the computer executes them. The alternative, the opposite approach is you can let the computer learn how to process the data from empirical examples and that's the deep learning based approach. And so instead of you pre-specifying what the computer is going to do, you feed it um, uh, empirical examples and it learns how to process the data from that. Um, and in short, you know, in my experience, but also there's a massive, massive literature showing this, like the second approach is going to tend to give you much more robust um, results. Um, so, you know, rule-based approaches, they have the advantage of being easy to understand. Most of us are used to thinking that way. Certainly they have their place, um, but typically we find that they perform pretty poorly. Um, in our sort of economic context. And there's two reasons for that. Um, rules do not like complexity and they don't like noise. And the sorts of information that we'd like to process, it tends to be complex. You know, the table structures I showed you from the Japanese documents, those are really complex table structures. They don't follow simple rules. Um, and then there's noise in them. Again, like if you have scans of documents, if you have OCR text, it's gonna be full of noise. Um, and that noise is going to derail your rules. Um, and in a sense, complexity and noise are kind of like the same thing. Um, essentially you write rules, but they don't hold because your documents have exceptions or because there's noise in them and then you have to write exceptions to the rules, but then there's exceptions to those exceptions and exceptions to that. And it just takes you down this rabbit hole um, where it's going to tend to be very brittle and not perform particularly well. 
Um, whereas deep learning allows us to learn a robust mapping between the raw data and desired output in a way that if done well, can accurately uh, process new data that the model was not exposed to during training. Um, so you can think of it as a really powerful universal function approximator that has potentially millions of estimated parameters. Um, you're probably not going to be training that model from scratch because rarely uh, will we have kind of there's exceptions you know like i was talking about the ocr engine where we can um you know generate millions of labeled examples um but typically um you're going to build upon what the literature has already done you're going to go and you're going to take roberta or bert and you're going to uh, download that model and then you're going to fine tune it to your particular context um you're going to use um a com net that was pre-trained on ImageNet. Um, and then you're going to fine tune that to your context. Um, and so in some sense, you have these huge models. They've already learned a lot from being exposed to other problems. They're going to need to be fine tuned on your specific problem. Um, but that's going to be realistic to do because of the power of transfer learning, because you can take a model that, you know, an image classifier that was pre-trained to classify, you know, the 140 different types of dog breeds that appear in ImageNet, but it's actually going to have learned something about vision from that. And so you're going to be able to fine tune it to recognize different types of document images in your data set. Okay, so deep learning um, can play a role in pretty much every step of the data curation pipeline. So taking the newspaper example I gave, it underlies the layout analysis and the image pre-processing. Deep learning is what allows you to do OCR. It allows you to assemble structured data, things like predicting the reading order. You can use it for post-processing, you know, deep methods to fix OCR errors, for example. I mean, it underlies the natural language processing. So kind of throughout the steps that you potentially need to take raw information and convert it into structured data, um, deep learning is, is really, really powerful. Um, and the really useful thing here is that um, there's many parallels like between the methods. And so, you know, for those of you who are familiar with natural language processing, you'll know how much, you know, the transformer, transformer based models have just completely revolutionized NLP in the past several years. And recently, you know, there's been a lot of progress with self attention and transformer based vision models for computer vision kind of moving away from the ComNet paradigm towards that. Um, and so you can be doing very different tasks on um, and um, you don't have to kind of learn totally from scratch. Once you have a good understanding of modern NLP methods, it's not that much of a leap to understand modern image processing methods. Um, okay, so when I tell people what I've been working on, I'd say the most common reaction is for people to say, you know, isn't there an app or, you know, some kind of commercial product that does this? That's not going to be true, you know, unfortunately, our documents are very unique. Um, it's also not going to be true in natural language processing with any sort of uh, acceptable accuracy. Um, so if we take the case of OCR, right, commercial OCR software are trained on clean, modern documents with simple layouts, like single column books. As economists, what are we interested in? You know, what do we need to OCR? Typically noisy documents. Oftentimes they're historical. Um, many times they have highly complex layouts. The OCR software doesn't know what to do with that because it wasn't exposed to anything like that in training. Um, and so there's a huge benefit to understanding the deep learning that underlies OCR and being able to have your own custom tailored solution. In short, we're a really long ways away from having artificial general intelligence, which is what you need for like one piece of software designed by Google to like work on any sort of document um, that you wanted to feed it. And so people might kind of, you know, have, have the prior that there should be a commercial solution to all the things that we want to do to process data, but we're simply not uh, close to that at all. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Um, and, you know, even if there was a market for creating that commercial solution, um, 
a lot of the problems we do with deal with they're supervised problems you need labeled data that labeled data doesn't exist you know and so for example if you have a particular set of documents that you want to digitize you know it's really on you to create the labeled data that would be needed to kind of to automate that digitization process um Okay, and I should say the same thing's true for NLP. And so you all have probably seen the hype around models like GPT-3 that are supposed to be, you know, completely zero shot, just work without fine tuning at all. But um, in general, that's not really the case. The need to fine tune on your specific application is not going to go away anytime soon. So by investing in these deep learning skills, I think you're really investing in learning about methods that are going to kind of serve your research well um, for an extended period of time. Okay, so, you know, beyond saying, you know, isn't there an app that will do that? People will say, well, why not just manually digitize things? Um, you know, I think that the, the, that process is unsatisfactory for a variety of reasons. You guys, I'm probably already preaching to the choir, and so I don't think I need to kind of convince you why deep learning is better than trying to send all your data off to Cambodia to get somebody to type it in. But I'll just say in short, usually it's not going to have the accuracy they promised. There's lots of issues. The data set may just be too large to process in the first place, et cetera. So again, you can really do things with deep learning methods that would be impossible um, otherwise. Um, and then finally, you know, a, a common question is, um, well, how is this different from the digital humanities? Didn't digital humanities people already do this stuff? Um, and, you know, in short, not really the sort of documents that people want to process in the digital humanities are different. I'd say in economics, like errors tend to be quite catastrophic. If you have a, a table and you cut off all the leading ones of your numbers, then every, you know, your analysis is obviously going to be really off. And so I think we just have somewhat different um, you know, somewhat different needs than people in the digital humanities, um, which necessitates really, um, you know, having our own community and our own set of tailored resources that helps us to create the kind of data that's useful to us as quantitative social scientists. All right. Um, so now I want to say a word about the resources that we've been working on that I hope that um, some of you guys may find uh, useful in your own work. Um, and so the deep learning literature is huge. You know, it's not uncommon for computer scientists to write like 40 papers a year. Um, it moves very fast. And figuring out where to start and which methods are applicable to economic data is like a major investment. And the same is true if you want to actually implement these methods. Um, and you know, so what I'd really like to do is to be able to reduce those startup costs, which is going to make it more feasible for more economists to say this is worth investing in for my research. Um, and so there's a couple of ways that we've been working to do that. Um, so the first is to create a knowledge base with links to useful references to kind of point people who are just getting started with this literature, like in the direction that they need to go to learn about the methods that are particularly applicable to us um, as people who would like to take raw information and turn it into economic data. Uh, the second thing that we focused on is building an open source Python package uh, for document image analysis. Um, and so I'll give you know a brief overview of both of those. Um, and so if you go to my website, um, uh, there's a knowledge base about deep learning methods for curating data at scale. Um, and I think the most useful thing about it is it has links to a lot of other great resources that are out there um, that you can use to get started. So, you know, at a basic level, uh, why do we want to use deep learning? What are alternatives? What are rule-based approaches? What is deep learning? How do you train a neural network? Um, and so those are sort of a, a series of introductions to the topic. And then we talk about, um, you know, it, it points you to read different types of resources to get started with image processing. So what are um, CNNs? Um, how do you do image classification? How do you do object detection, which is what underlies recognizing the tables, the document structures that I showed you? Um, active learning based layout annotation and labeling hacks. Central to making deep learning approaches feasible is to have an efficient pipeline for annotation. And so 
understanding active learning and different hacks um, for reducing the cost of annotation is just a huge determinant of whether or not the deep learning pipeline that you might want to implement is actually going to be feasible given your labeling budget. Um, fine tuning object detection models, visualization, how can we think about what these models are doing under the hood? Um, and then um, GANs, which as I mentioned are um, super useful um, you know, in a variety of contexts, pre-processing, being able to generate data for training so you don't have to create your own labeled data, et cetera. And, you know, so you can go to the knowledge base. If you're not familiar with these topics, it will point you to some really useful resources um, for getting started. Um, there's also a section on OCR. What's the model architecture that underlies OCR? How do you do it in practice? Um, how do you put it all together? And then there's also a series of posts on natural language processing, you know, starting with basic topics like models of words, dependency parsing, which is often useful for extracting data out of text. Um, how do we think about modeling language, sequence to sequence learning, and then of course the transformer and transformer based methods, which are likely to underlie any of the sort of modern kind of NLP based approaches that, that you might be using. Um, and then applications of that. So retrieval, which is a huge uh, kind of um, a, a huge area of being able to work with text data. How do we figure out what are the relevant parts of the text to what you want to analyze? If you're starting with, you know, uh, 500 million like newspaper articles across time, how do you find the ones that are about the New Deal, uh, for example? Um, sentiment analysis. Um, zero shot and few shot learning in NLP, and then finally NLP on noisy data, which if, especially if you're kind of like OCR in your own documents that you're then gonna be using NLP to process, um, it's gonna look very different than people who are working with Wikipedia, um, you know, which is gonna have far fewer um, errors in it. And so again, I try to point to resources that, that could be helpful for getting started with any of these topics or for thinking about how they apply to economics. Um, and so, you know, check that out if you're kind of interested in any of this stuff and aren't already, you know, super familiar with it. Um, the, the other thing that I want to discuss is our open source Python package, uh, which is called Layout Boxer. And so I worked uh, with uh, a pre-doc, Zijing Shen, and some other open source collaborators to take the models and tools that we've developed um, for our projects and to integrate them into an open source Python package um, that's called Layout Parser. The code is available um, on GitHub. And the aim is to streamline the use of deep learning and document image analysis pipelines. And so we try to provide simple and intuitive interfaces for applying and customizing deep, learn out, deep learning models for layout detection, uh, character recognition, and other document processing tasks. Um, and we have a paper, you can find that on my website, um, that also describes um, the, uh, the package. Um, and so our motivation is that if you want to implement a document image analysis pipeline, so you want to start with a raw document, like it could be a table, it could be the newspaper scans, it could be biographies, a lot of different things, and you want to convert that into a structured database, you're trying to implement that from scratch, which is what we were doing, you know, it really takes building a substantial amount of expertise. And currently there's no full fledged infrastructure for easily curating, um, you know, uh, the target document image data sets and fine tuning or retraining layout analysis models. Um, it's difficult for research teams to learn about how full pipelines are implemented, which leads, you know, us to reinvent the wheel. Um, which is not kind of efficient for, um, for anyone. And so this is the functionalities of the package. And so you'd start with a document image and there's different ways to use this. And so the most straightforward way is you could just use the layout models that, are, that come with the package off the shelf. And you can do that with just four lines of code. If your documents do not look like the document that those models were trained on, it's not going to give you satisfactory results, right? Because this goes back to what I was saying, there is no kind of general artificial intelligence yet. There's not a model that's going to work on anything throughout it. Um, if, but if your documents look like kind of the documents that those models were trained on, maybe you can just use it off the shelf. And that's four lines of code, very simple. 
Um, but more likely than not, your documents are going to be different. Um, but we provide a lot of tools that you can use. Um, and specifically, we provide an, an interface for efficient data annotation. So you can use this package to create the labels that you would need to train your own layout analysis model. And then you can do that customized model training. You can train mask RCNN. You can fine tune it to your tables, which don't look like our tables by creating those annotations with the software that comes with the package and then using the package um, to actually fine tune the mask RCNN model that's going to recognize those layouts. Once you have those layouts, you can send the content to OCR. Um, and then finally, you can store and export that content. And you can also use the package to visualize the results of the layout detection and the OCR. Um, so let me explain these functionalities in a little bit more um, detail so it will be clear. Um, so as I said, if it, it comes with um, uh, some layout detection models. And hopefully over time, people who use this package will contribute their models and there will be more layout detection models there. And you can use those off the shelf with four lines of code, which are shown here. If those work well for your particular context, you can just recognize the layout um, with the code shown here. Um, these are the models that are currently there. Um, and, you know, so again, right now it's a bit, it's, it's pretty limited, but our goal over time is to have, you know, both we will contribute more models, but hopefully people who use this package will also share their models, um, which will make it applicable off the shelf um, to more people. And so these are the kind of models that come with it. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do you want to store this information? What are, are the data structures that you need for this layout information to be useful, right? So you extract different types of information. Most basically for the layouts, you extract the coordinates. Like oftentimes, like in a table, those are going to be a rectangle. They could be a quadrilateral if your document is skewed and so that um, the, um, the layout regions aren't um, actually a rectangles but, but quadrilateral. So you also have image classes and you might have additional information. Um, and we aim to give a lot of flexibility in how you can store and transform that information that makes out the layout, makes up the layouts to your documents. Um, okay, and you can perform different operations on the layout information, which is really useful. So you can pad the layouts. You know, so if you've detected um, where the titles, the column titles and the row titles and the individual cells are in your table before you send that to OCR, you might want to add a little, a couple of pixels of padding to that to make sure you don't cut off the edge of a number, right? And you can easily do that um, in this package. And so it allows you to easily kind of transform the information about your layouts in ways that might be useful to your pipeline. Um, there's also the ability to call OCR engines. So you can call Tesseract or Google Cloud Vision. Um, we also provide some code that you could use as a starting point for training your own OCR engine if you wanted to do that. Um, you can store the information like in different formats like JSON, which is usually the most useful or formats like CSV. Um, you can load um, data sets. Um, and layout analysis specific formats like COCO, which would be useful if you already have some labeled data that you want to use to fine tune a model. Um, and then finally, um, there, there's um, tools to be able to visualize the, the results of your layout analysis. And so here on the left, this is a page from our paper about this package. And you can see we uh, used one of the off the shelf models to run layout analysis on it. And it's showing you the regions that it detected. So those green boxes um, are the um, paragraph regions and the red boxes are the titles and the yellow boxes are the figures, right? So you can visualize with this package um, what the layout regions detected in their classes are, which has, helps you to get a sense for how well the model's doing. You can also, um, in the second mode, actually visualize the OCR text on the same place on the page as it appeared in the original document. And you can see that side by side with the original document. And so that helps in being able to assess the accuracy of the um, OCR. So as I mentioned, you know, there's a huge diversity of documents out there. You might have some very 
um, you know, some documents that are very specific to your context. They're not going to look like documents that anybody has processed with this package before. And so you're going to need to train your own pipeline that has been fine tuned on labeled examples from your documents. And the biggest challenge to this is just making the annotation feasible. Um, and um, so part of that is, you know, having the right kind of uh, active learning framework, part of it is having a good interface for annotation. And we try to help um, with both of those. Um, and um, so um, active learning methods typically um, score and select samples to label at the image level and not at the object level. Uh, but that might, that can, we found that can be very inefficient on lots of social science documents because in a single like image of a table, you may have some very, very common um, uh, types of classes um, that the models seem a lot and it doesn't need more labels to recognize, but you may also have the uncommon objects that appear in that table that you need to label. Um, and so we worked on developing a method um, that selects at the object level and not at the image level um, what you need to annotate. Um, and you know, so essentially that's shown here. The challenge of this is, you know, you want to draw evenly from out the distribution of layout objects, but that's unobserved ex ante. Um, and um, so there's a paper on my website where you can learn more about this. Um, but essentially, we use a perturbation approach to do object level active learning to select in a given document image um, the objects uh, that are most likely to need um, human labeling. Um, and it works pretty well. Um, of course, to be able to do this in practice, you need an interface to do it. And this goes back to a huge theme in deep learning, which you should not think about deep learning as replacing you or your human capital, but really as complementing it. And having a good like human computer interface um, is huge to being able to use deep learning productively in your own, in your own research. And so we took an open source package uh, called Label Studio and we made various modifications to it to make it really suitable for annotating document images that we typically sort of see in the social sciences. And so this is, you know, examples of that interface. You see um, in panel A, we've taken a scan from a, a newspaper image and we did some preliminary labeling and uh, ran the model. And you can see that it's not doing great. It totally fails to detect certain regions, et cetera. We would expect that because we haven't labeled that much data yet. Uh, but you can visualize the things that the model has already predicted and just correct the things that are wrong. Um, so it fails to recognize that big banner headline at the top. You can draw the box around that, but you don't have to draw the boxes around all the things that the model's already getting right. Um, you can also use our active learning score to highlight regions that may be particularly problematic. You can make all the layout boxes that, the, that you displayed opaque so you can see where it's missing things. And in general, this allows you to just correct where the model's gotten things wrong rather than doing everything, having to label all those boxes from scratch. And that makes it much more efficient. So that allows you to produce the image on the right where you correctly labeled everything. And when you've done some of that, you can go retrain the model, get better predictions, and you essentially inter iterate on this. And the interface is just meant to make it very efficient for you to, lay, to, to create the labels uh, from your documents that you will need um, to train um, you know, your own layout analysis model. Um, and there's also an API for actually fine tuning um, the layout analysis model. Um, so you don't have to go and download the code yourself and you can use you can use our API to use the labels that you've created to actually fine tune your own model. And so, for example, you know, we use this package um, to produce, um, you know, the, the, this analysis where we're recognizing these different layouts of this complex Japanese table. So, you know, we use the um, labeling interface that we created to, to create the labels for the documents, um, you know, use the code to kind of fine tune our own models. Um, and so it's very kind of useful in practice. Um, and we were able to, you know, achieve a pretty high level of accuracy. So just to conclude in time to leave a few minutes for questions, um, you know, so I've argued that deep learning offers enormous potential 
to unlock novel sources of data from things like document images, but also from text, from video, from other things that I had kind of less time to talk about today. Uh, becoming familiar with these methods, how they apply to economics, how could they can be actually implemented and debugged, that has a lot of startup costs to it. And so by having an open source document image analysis package and a knowledge base, um, you know, my aim has been to make it easier for um, people to come up to speed with these methods and to be able to use them to create the data that they would need to study questions that they find, you know, uh, fascinating and, um, and fulfilling. Thank you so much uh, for that, Melissa, and thanks for um, leaving uh, time for questions at the end. Um, I didn't see any in the chat, so uh, this would be a great time to um, ask them. And it looks like uh, our star pupil, Jan Spies, has the first question. So please, Jan, uh, go ahead. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks a lot for the talk, Melissa. Um, you talked at length about the importance of you know tailoring the tool to the specific kind of documents you have. I was curious about also tailoring it to the research questions you're asking. So I could imagine that depending on which questions you're interested downstream, you may also want to be careful about certain aspects or um, more generally, I'm curious what kind of, if I'm using those tools to extract information to then do some inferences, what um, kind of verification you want to do in those first steps to tailor to the specific research question you, you're going to ask with it. Yeah, definitely. So I think that this is an area where sort of our applications oftentimes differ from what computer scientists have done. Um, you know, so the object detection models that, that I was talking about that are used to do kind of the image analysis stuff, it's the same thing where, you know, it's the same underlying model that you take a picture of your cat, like on your iPhone, and your phone will tag the cat, right? And if like the box around the cat chops off the edge of the cat's tail, that's okay because you can still tell it's a cat, right? Whereas if you are using this to recognize structures in a table and you chop off the leading digit in like all your numbers, everything's gonna be off by an order of magnitude, right? And then that's, you know, that, that, that is going to be um, useless to you. Um, there's other examples where it might not be so catastrophic. Like if you're, um, ocr text from a newspaper, um, you know, you can do things like spell check the output or do more sophisticated versions of spell check. It might not be such a big deal, right? Um, and so I think really like um, how you design your pipeline, you have to have in mind what errors are going to do to sort of your downstream analysis. Um, and so if you need really, really accurate layout regions, um, you are going to need kind of more labels to achieve that. And you're going to need, you know, to also use your label data, obviously, to evaluate how well you're doing. Um, and, um, you know, this, this also goes back to, you know, having a, a, like an active learning based approach for labeling. So you're sampling from the full distribution, right? Um, I think, you know, depending on what NLP methods that you want to use, noise is going to be kind of more or less catastrophic. And there is a literature uh, that I reference kind of in the knowledge base about NLP on noisy text. And it tries to evaluate, you know, if you have, you know, spelling errors in your text, how big of a deal is that going to be to the performance of, you know, a topic classifier um, downstream. Um, and so I think that that absolutely should be front and center of what you have in mind. Like, what are the noises, you know, for like another example for the Japanese project I mentioned, we didn't want to have to design our own OCR engine because that was a lot of work. Um, but this is a context where errors are catastrophic. Japanese names tend to be like four characters, three characters wrong. If you get one of them wrong, you have a really big fuzzy mashing problem. So that's a context where it really paid off to design our own OCR engine. For the newspaper stuff, we didn't have to do it because it was off the shelf OCR was pretty decent. And, you know, the typos didn't really, you know, we did some, um, some tests and they didn't have a huge effect on kind of our downstream analysis. And so I think that, you know, always take a subsample of your data, see what that noise is gonna do to what you wanna do downstream. Melissa, I am, um, if you don't mind, I had a quick question, which is just about your research 
sort of strategy and production function. Um, you know, just, just looking at all of the really interesting papers you wrote before embarking on this um, journey, it seems pretty clear you could have easily continued on that trajectory and kept writing papers like that. And I'm just wondering, you know, a, a lot of um, us who are kind of on the earlier side of doing research face these kinds of decisions about like, wow, do I make this huge investment to go in this totally different direction? Or do I kind of like keep going in a direction that would be kind of more staying the course? And I just love to know a little bit more about how you made that decision and what your psychology was like and um, whether it was a hard decision. I think that, um, you know, sort of um, at the end of the day, it's important to do what you find interesting. And you can also sink a lot of time into like trying to stay the course and doing something that, you know, kind of doesn't quite um, work. So as I mentioned, there's like, you know, questions that I've been interested in, and I spent a lot of time kind of trying to answer them maybe with more aggregated data, like at the municipal or the county level, um, and just found that that approach like wasn't um, really satisfactory and also took a lot of time, um, you know, like manually correcting errors and data entry and stuff. Um, and so I think going this route, it was both like really interesting um, to do. I've enjoyed it a lot. It's been a lot of fun to learn kind of about these methods. Um, but it, I also felt like it just opens up kind of so many different questions. But yeah, it, did, it has taken like a huge amount of time. I think it could have taken a lot less time if I'd like known where to start and hadn't been kind of stumbling around the literature trying to figure out like, you know, what, um, what was actually um, relevant, but in some sense, like, I mean, I'm sure that there's like better times to embark on new things. You probably don't want to do that three months before you're going to go on the job market, right? But there's also like, in some ways, there's never a good time, right? And so ultimately, if there's something that you're interested and in, excited about at some time, you know, you have to pursue it. I think people who are kind of um, you know, have recently started a postdoc or a junior faculty position, you actually have like a fair amount of time, um, you know, before um, you, you're likely to come up for tenure. And so there's actually like, I think that there is time to kind of recoup those investments. Um, and so I think you just kind of have to think, you know, clearly there's a time to, to finish things up and get things out the door. Um, but in general, uh, there's also, you know, you should be doing something that you find interesting and stimulating and um, the returns to, to um, you know, being able to make progress in a way that, that no one's been able to do before because you've invested in kind of getting data sources that no one's had before that can really be a big return and can make those investments worthwhile. And they scale really well, you know, any idea I have, if that particular idea doesn't work well, I can use the method to do something else. So it's not like if you're sitting there doing something by hand and then the project doesn't work, that's just gone. Like this is very uh, transferable. So I think that's worth keeping in mind as well. Thanks. Um, so we're at the top of the hour. Uh, sorry, Shishu, I um, uh, didn't see your hand up, but maybe um, since we've got another um, 45 minutes with you, uh, Melissa, maybe we can end the live stream here and take the um, 